Hello, everyone. Once again, welcome to our Bible study today. We are going to be looking at the next portion of the book of Exodus that we began last time, so Exodus chapter 2. Um, this is a Bible study that, uh, yeah, we just began last week, and I'm going to start my clock here to try to keep us at, no, I will keep us at half an hour, um, and I need to get into it because uh, no messing around. We've got a lot to cover. So let's begin with prayer, and we will get into our Bible study today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the blessings that you give us, that even during um, the, the problems that we go through in our lives, that your guiding hand is still with us, your word is with us, where you share with us your truth. Continue to strengthen us in that truth as we grow in you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, let me uh, get our screen shared here so we can look at our study for today. Um, here we go. Our newest PowerPoint. So we will uh, get into that. And... Uh, There we go. So yes, Exodus, God keeps his promises is where we are going today. A little bit of review from last week. You could call it a quiz, but uh, review sounds better. Um, so I got a little uh, review for us to begin with today. First question is this, how long would the sons of Jacob stay in Egypt? We talked about that last week. So in other, other words, how long were the Israelites um, in Egypt, partly uh, for that time they were enslaved. Was it A, 40 years, B, 430 years, C, 1400 years, or D, 4000 years? I guess just because one maybe is a funny number um, as opposed to the others more rounded numbers. But yeah, uh, the answer there is B, 430 years. We talked about how that was longer than us by a lot as a nation. So 430 years is how long the Israelites were in Egypt. Next question is, what did Pharaoh do to keep the Israelites in submission? Was it A, he put slave masters over them? B, he worked them ruthlessly with hard labor? C, he ordered the death of their male babies? Uh, trick question, right? Because the answer is, a and B and C. We get the wave there. So yeah, all of those things Pharaoh did to uh, oppress the Israelites. Our third question is this. What excuse did the Israelite midwives give for the reason that they allowed the baby boys to live? So remember the Pharaoh went to these midwives and told them if it's a girl, let it live. If it's a boy, it must die. Um, and then he looked and saw all these little boys were still running around and said, why have you not um, listened to me? Why ha have they not been killed? So did the midwives say, A, the Israelites are no longer having children? It would make sense, maybe. They were enslaved and uh, they were fearful of having children. Was that the reason? B, that God sent an angel? to stop them from doing their job so that God warned them through an angel. C, did they say the Israelite women were tough and had their babies without them? Or is it D, did they tell Pharaoh that he was evil and therefore they could not obey him? Only one of these is, is correct, um, and it was an excuse. It, it wasn't the truth. But the reason that the women gave was that... Uh, See, our women are just tougher than you soft Egyptians. And when it's time to have a baby, they just have a baby. They don't wait for the midwives. Again, it wasn't the truth, but it was their excuse that um, they cleverly gave to Pharaoh and he seemed to accept. Bonus review. Um, this one's a little bit uh, more difficult, maybe. What were the names of the Israelite midwives? If you thought the others were too easy, so I, I have to, to give you um, a tougher one. The names of the Israelite midwives, was it A, Jezebel and Delilah? Was it B, Miriam and Deborah? Was it C, Shifra and Pua? 
or was it D, Hager, and Sarah? Mm, all women, biblical names, Jezebel and Delilah, not them. They, they were nasty, nasty women in, in different ways. Uh, um, Delilah betrayed Samson and was unfaithful. Jezebel was the wicked wife of evil King Ahab. So not them. Miriam was the sister of Moses and Aaron. Deborah was a prophetess a few years down the, the road. Hagar was the uh, concubine or the, the, uh, the servant of Sarah who had a child with Abraham. They both had children. Sarah was his wife, um, Isaac and Ishmael. But the answer is C, Shifra and Pua. How did you do on your quiz? Um, doesn't really matter, I guess, um, other than it's good for us to, to review. And uh, if you didn't get them all right, that's okay. We're just doing a little bit of review. So let's get into our lesson for today. As uh, I've said, we only have so much time, right? That's what I promised. So let's jump right into the text here, Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So grab your Bible or follow along here. Um, hopefully you're, you're comfortable and ready to go. I don't know why there's an 8 there, probably because I copied and pasted this onto something from last lesson. Um, it should be a one at the beginning there. There's my first mistake of the day. I'm sure there'll probably be more. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a, oh goodness, I cut myself off here. I can't see that. Um, how does it read? Another mistake, how about that? <laughs> when uh, she could find him no longer, she got a papyrus basket, that's what it is, for him, and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. And her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his nurse, sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son, she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So here we have Moses, who is the author of the book of Exodus, talking about how um, this all transpired and came to be. Uh, some questions of the text that we're just going to kind of work through. Um, first of all, how could Moses' parents be so brave? So um, they take their child and they set him off down the river. Um, how could they do that? Um, well, scripture gives us a little bit of an insight in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, that's the heroes of faith chapter. And it says there in verse 23, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. And then they couldn't hide him any longer. Babies get louder. And I suppose his cries could be heard outside the house. Um, because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. A couple things stand out to me there from that Hebrews passage. First of all, they saw that he was no ordinary child. I think that's more than just parental pride. You know, every parent thinks that their baby is the cutest and the greatest and the best. But I think, well, they already had two children for sure. There's Aaron, his older brother, and Miriam. Um, who were already born before Moses. So they recognized something about this child, that he was special, that he was different. Um, they also knew God's promise to Abraham and the actions of Jacob and Joseph. So Hebrews 11 says, by faith they did this. So remember, God promised Abraham, not that he would be a great nation down in Egypt, but that he would be his own great nation, the descendants would be many. Also, remember the actions of Jacob and Joseph when they died, their bones, what did they do? 
they shipped them back up to the cave that, that Abraham had purchased. So they were saying something, and, and certainly this was part of the spiritual heritage of, of the Israelites, um, both God's promises to Abraham that they would have, uh, that they would have treasured and, and retold, and those actions of Jacob and Joseph um, would have been part of that, that spiritual heritage. So they knew that. And so maybe Moses' parents understand this is the one that God is going to use to deliver our people. Or, um, and, and we have to be careful, the Bible doesn't say that, but, but um, Hebrews 11 kind of gives that hint, doesn't it? You kind of have that feeling that they realized something's up with this, with this baby. They were also not afraid of the king's edict. Um, it also stands out to me. So Pharaoh can say what he wants but we're going to follow God. Just like Shifra and Pua, those, those heroic Egyptian midwives um, didn't obey the king's Egypt edict, and neither are these parents. And uh, many other Israelites said, too, we're going we're gonna to follow what God says rather than what a wicked king says. A couple of questions. Did they know that the Pharaoh's daughter would find him? That question comes up. Um, so they take him to the river, and, you know, they make this little papyrus basket and they cover it with tar pitch or whatever. So it's going to float and it's going to keep him dry and warm and safe and everything. So basically the question is, was this all planned? Did they have this scouted out that Pharaoh's daughter was going to come down? You know, I kind of remember in Sunday school, I think I was taught, you know, I sort of at least maybe, maybe it wasn't taught, but I imagine this in my mind that here's this huge Nile River and they plunk him down into the river and off he goes. Could it have been that? Sure, it could have been that. You wonder, though, if uh, there wasn't a little scouting here. Um, either way, it was done in faith, right? I, I think there was a confidence on the part of Moses' parents that this is going to turn out okay. And the only way that could be is, is they trusted those promises and they believed. They, they had faith in God that, that he would provide. So I would say, uh, did they know for sure that Pharaoh's daughter, maybe, maybe they did, maybe they had it scouted out, but it doesn't um, lessen the, the uh, faith of the parents. What were some of the, goodness, I wish I uh, had not had my little, my little uh, questions cut off here all the time with my, with my video here of me. Um, so what's the question? What were some, oh, What were some of the benefits? There we go. What were some of the benefits of being raised in the home? So benefits of the being raised in the home of Pharaoh's daughter. That's the question I'm trying to get across here. Um, so yeah, he starts out obviously born into an Israelite home. He ends up in an Egyptian home, probably at about age three after he's weaned. So his, his uh, mother is able to nurse him and uh, raise him. Uh, up till about age three, maybe a little bit later even. Um, but he ends up being raised in the home of Pharaoh's daughter. I would say the best of both worlds. Um, you, you talk to um, education people today, and they talk about how the fact that our personalities are formed by age two, which is kind of crazy, that, um, that people kind of insist on that, that um, we're pretty much the way we're going to be by age two, <laughs> which is kind of startling. Um, so he would have been Moses already. I mean, so, but, but that happened in his own home. So who he's going to be, that, that man that he's going to be, has already been imprinted upon him in his Israelite home, a God-fearing home. But the benefit, though, of being in Egypt, Egypt was the pinnacle of learning of its day. So Egypt is, is uh, the place for progress, for innovation, for education. So Moses would have learned to write. He would have learned to read. Um, he would have learned principles of mathematics. People talk about, you know, the great building projects in Egypt. They probably had the Pythagorean theorem down pretty well. Um, so mathematics and science, he probably as raised in, you know, as a noble, as a noble person, nobleman in a, in a high household like that, one of the highest in the land, he probably would have studied, um, you know, history and tactics of warfare and even how to, to go into battle, other things like they talk about probably um, learn to hunt. 
all of these things are going to serve Moses well later. And it's kind of that, that neat hand of God, you know, silently working and things that just seem to be random are going to serve Moses well in the days and the years to come. So, yeah, we could say how fortunate, but fortune has nothing to do with it, right? This was God um, raising up this future leader for his people and doing it in, in the, an extraordinary way. What is the great irony of Moses becoming the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter? Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. Again, the, the, the wisdom of God. So when Egypt is its strongest, um, God raises up one of the weakest, right? A slave. And uh, a slave that was supposed to die at the Pharaoh's decree. Um, just, just think about that. You know, God is in charge of all things. So, um, yeah, the future leader of Israel is raised in the home of his enemy. How about that? So Pharaoh is raising up this guy that is going to really wipe out Egypt in, in a lot of different ways and uh, conquer Egypt even as slaves. So, yeah, the child raised by Egypt will conquer Egypt, God's way of doing things. We think of the birth of Jesus and uh, Galatians chapter 4 says, When the time had fully come, God sent forth his son. So when the timing was just right, God sent Jesus into the world. Um, when the time had fully come, God raised up Moses. And he did it in some, yeah, pretty fantastic sort of uh, ironic ways. Exodus chapter 2, 11 to 15 is our next section. We have to keep going. Um, as I promised, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out, <clears throat> excuse me, saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. So things have changed dramatically, suddenly for Moses. So let's talk a little bit about that section. I've got a couple questions for us there again. Was Moses an Egyptian or an Israelite? I think that's a fascinating um, point to ponder, just because obviously he's an Israelite. He was born an Israelite and imprinted those, you know, those early years upon him, but he's also an Egyptian. Um, people will say that Moses has a Hebrew name, that the word Moshe um, means to, well, his, his name, um, because she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Um, so people will say, well, that's a, that's a Hebrew word to, to draw out water, something like that. Maybe there's also some, some evidence though, that it's, it's could be a form of, uh, an Egyptian word as well. And you think of names like Ramses, um, in, in, uh, Egyptian. So Moses, you know, so yeah, it, it's disputed whether it really was a Hebrew name, possibly it was as an Egyptian name, which seems to kind of fit for, for Moses. Is this guy an Egyptian or is he an Israelite? He's dressed like an Egyptian. We're going to read about this in the next section. Um, so he, he flees to Midian and the women identify him not as an Israelite. They don't say, hey, look, there's an, an Israelite. They, they look and they say, there's this Egyptian guy out here. So um, he's got a of both. He's, he's a mix. Um, but certainly Moses seems to be identifying um, as an Israelite. What did it say um, in that section? Um, one of his own people. So he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. That seems to be an insight into what Moses is thinking. Um, his people are being put down. So yeah, he's a mix. 
but probably may, you know, the majority he identifies as an Israelite. But he is torn you know, between those two worlds. Who, who am I? And, and that would make sense. Um, probably had great respect and, and love for some of the Egyptians, that especially those who raised him. You would think he was treated well, certainly love for his, his um, natural family too, who gave him life. Did Moses believe he was going to be the deliverer of Israel? So this is a strong act, right? Um, Moses uh, attacks this, this man, who this Egyptian, who's beating the Israelite. I mean, wow, he, he's, he's totally taking um, justice into his own hands. And was that just Moses being impulsive? Was, was, did it anger him and, and he thought nothing of it? Um, you wonder, did, did, you know, if, if his parents view Moses as an extraordinary child, was that passed on to Moses? Um, maybe, you know, maybe Moses thinks and believes that uh, he is going to be the one, that he is going to be the deliverer of, of Israel. And we've, and that would seem a little maybe less certain to me as, as purely speculation, but we do have this verse. So this is Stephen, that early Christian martyr. He's about to be put to death, but before he makes everybody super angry, he tells them um, what God's plan was, um, walks them through Old Testament history. And this is, this is what he says about Moses. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. So what is Stephen saying? Um, Moses thought that people would understand, I'm, I'm to be your leader. And, uh, but they didn't realize that. So it, the, certainly the implication seems to be that Moses believed he was going to be the deliverer of Israel. And also realize we've gone very quickly, and the Bible does this a lot, where we get whiplash almost. I, I thought he was three years old, you know, just a second ago, a few verses ago, he's three years old. But remember at this time, by the time he flees to Midian, he's already 40 years old. So he's also had time to think about this and maybe see, you know, the plight of Israel and, and Moses in his special place as um, favored in the Egyptian household. So um, he's had time to think about this. He's had the time to grow and mature. What was Moses' mistake in this? Even if he believes he is the the leader that God has raised him up to, to bring the people out. Murder is not God's way, and this was not God's time. I thought that was a good summary in a commentary that I read in preparing for this. Um, so yeah, even though Moses believed that this was supposed to happen, or if, if he did believe that, then this is certainly not the way. God's not sanctioning the murder of somebody there. Um, so he's, it's Moses' timing, and it's Moses' justice, but it's, it's not God's. Um, he was full of zeal and courage, but not good judgment or patience, at least in this instance. Um, we're going to see plenty of, of uh, examples of that, that, that Moses is a very brave individual. There's, there's, there's no cowardice with him, um, but maybe not good judgment here and patience to let things happen. And bottom line, uh, Moses thinks he's, he's the solution here, and he's... he's uh, He's going to be the answer. He's going to be the deliverer. And look what happens by taking things into his own hands. Look what he's done. Um, the Egyptians hate him. Pharaoh, who loved him, now wants to kill him. And the Israelites basically have rejected him um, as their leader. Now, maybe it's a little strong to say that he's hated by the Israelites, but he's been rejected by the Israelites, clearly. And um, what did they say? Um, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptians? So yeah, we don't want you as ruler or judge of our people. Last section today, I'll read through again. Um, moving right along. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Raoul, their father, he asked them, 
Why have you returned so early today? They answered an Egyptian. There we go. I mentioned that before. They didn't identify him as an Israelite. They identified him as an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Raoul asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. He's saying, girls, we, we've got seven of you, and this sounds like a good guy. He, he came to the rescue, he watered the flock, and you didn't invite him home. Um, you, you, you may want to uh, have this fella as part of the family, which is what happens. Moses agreed to stay with a man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. So realize in these 16 or verses 16 to 25, so the first 15 verses of, Mo, of uh, Exodus chapter 2, that's 40 years. 16 to 25 here, this section is another 40 years, which seems crazy that God waits until Moses is 80 years old before he, the burning bush, Exodus chapter 3, next week, and calls him to, to leadership. But yeah, this covers another 40 years that Moses is gone. Isn't that amazing? Um, so he goes to Midian, and he is there 40 years and he gets married, and he has a son. Uh, a couple thoughts. The Midian, who are these Midianites? They're also descendants of Abraham, just like the Israelites are, but through a different uh, mother. After Sarah died, um, Abraham married Keturah, and after his, uh, yeah, after Sarah died, um, so the Midianites become a people, but also, so these are, are Moses' uh, half-brothers, we would say. And again, Moses is brave. What did he do? He drove off those uh, shepherds who seemed to be uh, um, bullying Raoul's daughters. And Moses comes to the rescue. So again, he's, he's brave. Moses is no, is no wimp. He's, he's no coward. You have to be impressed at his, his bravery. And Moses has a son, Gershom, which means stranger. Uh, remember, the naming of children in those days was much more about events and significance of what was going on in their lives, at least oftentimes. And a lot of, you know, we, we do names sometimes because of the significance of what the name means. A lot of times we just like how it sounds. So I don't know what that name means, but I like it. I like what it sounds or how it sounds. So I think Moses is uh, sending a message when he names his son Gershom. Um, maybe a little bit of dissatisfaction, right? Um, even though he's been with the Midianites or he's going to be for 40 years, he recognized this isn't home. I am a, a wanderer. I am a stranger here in Midian. Moses spends 40 years in Midian. During that time, Tutmos III dies. So Tutmos III was this great, powerful um, pharaoh. He expanded the empire. I think last time we called him the Napoleon of his day. He conquered um, a, a ton of different peoples, expanded um, Egyptians' empire greater than it had ever been. What happens during these additional 40 years, though? They also caused Israel to groan to God. So maybe when Moses is ready to lead them out, they're not quite ready, right? Slavery was awful. They were suffering, but maybe not to the, the degree that they were willing to act. So those 40 years, they, they serve a purpose. And God remembered them. That always sounds funny, doesn't it? When, when it says that um, God remembered them, he heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham. Not that he forgot. Um, God is God. He's, he cannot forget, right? It's just a way of expressing um, that God now was, was ready to act. Um, he remembered, what do we call that? An anthropomorphism is the big, long, fancy word. Basically, you're giving God, who is spirit and powerful and eternal and everything else, we're giving him human characteristics to help describe um, how he acts. So not that he forgot, but now he's ready to act. 
Final thoughts. We have a minute left. Just a, a thought that I, I considered going through this. Have you ever tried to force God's will? I think that was Moses' problem here, right? He, he recognized maybe the significance of the opportunity of what's going on and maybe his own role in that. And yet he felt like he had to make it happen. And maybe we do that sometimes too. We, we think there's only one answer and there's only one way. And so we, we try to, to corner God or, or pin him down and uh, maybe even excuse our actions sometimes that aren't so pure and good. Um, so that's, that's something to ponder. Um, think about that. Uh-oh. You know what that is. That means I'm supposed to say amen very soon. So let's get to our last thought here. What purpose was served by the delay in God's actions? So uh, that 40 years, um, what was the good that with that? And we, we touched on that already. That allowed Moses to mature. It allowed him to um, let God be the leader rather than, than himself. It also allowed the people to recognize that they needed help and, and to be ready to act. And one last quick thought was, is this, maybe how does that relate to our prayers? So we want things to happen, right? And, and we know what we think the answer should be. Sometimes, and surely this is an oversimplification, but I think sometimes we say there are three ways that God answers prayer. And, and I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's an overstatement, but it kind of works in a lot of ways that God might say yes to our prayers. He may say no to our, as an answer to our prayer. And he may be, he might say not yet or, or wait a while. And I think this is a great example of that, right? Uh, the prayers of the people, God wasn't saying no. Um, he wasn't saying yes. He was saying wait. And uh, both for Moses and for the people. And that's a great lesson for us too. Um, Sometimes we might get frustrated or, or think God's not listening. Um, he is. And he knows his promises that he has made to us. And I'm not saying just because we pray a really long time either that we're going to get our way. Not at all. That's not what this is saying. But there are certainly cases where God says not yet. And he will answer um, in according to his good and gracious will. But maybe, maybe sometimes it'll take years. And, and we, we just need to keep on praying, right? And, and not give up. And I think that's a nice encouragement for us there. That is our lesson for today. Next week, we are going to get into Exodus chapter three, which is this at the center of your screen here, the burning bush. Like I said last week, I think this artwork is kind of cool. All the stuff in here, all these Exodus symbols in it. But yeah, we really get into the call of Moses and that infamous burning bush. I hope um, you've enjoyed our time together. I certainly enjoy preparing it. And uh, yes, I cannot keep going on and on here. I would like to, but I, I have to say amen. So um, I will do that. Thanks for watching, tuning in, I guess. I look forward to preparing and teaching and sharing this next week with you, Exodus chapter God's blessing as you uh, continue to, to study it uh, together. Amen. There we go.